Hello everyone, hope we're all doing well. It's an absolutely glorious sunny day out here in the field. And today's a pretty exciting day because today, the first paper of my PhD, or well, the first data paper of my PhD, got published in the journal Evolution. So I thought I'd make a little video explaining what the main findings were. So here goes. Now I've always been awe of the complex arrangement of natural habitats. I mean, take this deciduous forest, for example. This place supports thousands upon thousands of different species. And that's all due to niche partitioning between different microhabitats. And finding a new niche actually plays a very big role in how species are formed in the first place. Now, the Amazon rainforest is the most complex and therefore most biodiverse place on the planet. So you might imagine that competition to find a new niche is pretty fierce over there. But what I'm interested in is whether these ecological shifts are reflected in the sensory systems of the animals living in these habitats. For example, if you're an animal which specialises in living in open, sunlit forest, then it makes sense for you to evolve adaptations that make you better suited to these environments compared to your cousin, which lives in the shade. Now, these visual adaptations have been studied when comparing diurnal versus nocturnal species, or in fish, which live in really deep lakes, where the amount of light availability decreases dramatically the deeper down you go but not an awful lot has been done on whether these visual adaptations arise in a terrestrial environment, like a forest, and at such a fine ecological scale between different microhabitats within a single rainforest community. I think it's time to introduce the butterflies. Now, as you might imagine, butterflies are pretty abundant in the Amazon rainforest, but there's one group in particular which stand out. They're called ethomine butterflies, and they've fascinated scientists ever since the birth of evolutionary biology. And their natural history is truly bonkers. There are around 400 species of these things spread across Latin America. But there's one particular aspect of their biology which is particularly relevant to this story, and that's their mimicry. Ethomines mimic the colour patterns of other ethomines to advertise to predators that they're toxic, that they're not good to eat. And this is an honest signal. There isn't a single ethomine butterfly out there which would be a tasty morsel. But by doing this, they're helping each other out because it means a naive predator will learn which butterfly colour patterns to avoid a lot quicker. OK, but how does this link in with the light environment stuff I was talking about earlier? Well, if you walk through one of these tropical forests, you'll see loads of different mimicry patterns. And the reason why there are so many is because these mimicry patterns are segregated between different microhabitats in the forest. Now, to a visual ecologist like me, that's pretty neat information because it means the mimicry pattern a butterfly has tells us what microhabitat it lives in. And that's crucial to the scientific questions I then set out to answer. I wanted to know whether shifts in mimicry, and therefore habitat, are reflected in the sensory systems of the butterfly. And we do that by looking inside the butterfly brain. Now, the butterfly brain is a pretty complex beast, but for this video, I just want you to focus on the large bulbous structures either side of what is called the central brain. They're called the optic lobes, and they process visual information coming from the eye. Now, in general, butterflies have pretty large optic lobes compared to other insects, and that's because vision is just so important to them in their day-to-day -day lives. But what I wanted to know was whether investment in this brain region, the optic lobe, varied between different ethomine species with different mimicry patterns. A few years ago, my PhD supervisor, Dr Stephen Montgomery, collected hundreds of butterfly brain samples from what is arguably the most biodiverse place on the planet. That's Yasuni National Park in the Amazon rainforest of eastern Ecuador. A truly magical place, and after three years of PhD, it looks like I'll finally be able to visit it later this year. And with some highly sophisticated laboratory and computational techniques, we were able to compare differences in brain structure between different clades or groups of ethomine butterfly. 
Now such a large data set produced a lot of cool findings, but one of the main things we did was compare these two ethomine butterfly clades, the hypothyris and the olorina. Now if you look closely at the different species within these clades, you'll see that in the hypothyris, all the species have these quite striking, bold, tiger stripe patterns as they're known in the field. Whereas Olorina tends to have slightly less flashy um, transparent wing patterns. And what we see is that species within Hypothyris invest significantly more in visual processing structures within their optic lobes. And that's because these mimicry patterns, these tiger stripe patterns, tend to be found in more open areas of the forest where there's more sunlight to go around. But could all of this just be due to chance? Well, I guess it could be, but one of the great things about studying these groups of butterflies is that we have a red herring, a classic example where the exception proves the rule. If you look closely at species within the Olorina clade, you will notice that not all the species within Olorina look the same. There is an odd one out, and that's this one a species called Hyperscada anchiala, which has evolved a completely different mimicry pattern to all the other species within the Olorina clade. In fact, it's more similar to species that we find in the Hypothyrus clade, to which it is distantly related. Well, this convergent evolution doesn't stop at just mimicry pattern. If you look at the optic lobes in Hyperscada anchiala, you will see it is more similar to species within Hypothyrus than other members of its own clade. Now that's pretty cool and a pretty good indicator that these shifts in brain structure are adaptive. In other words, natural selection has promoted larger optic lobes in species which are tiger stripe in colour pattern because that improves their survival in some way, either by helping them to avoid predators or helping them to find host plants so they can lay their eggs on more efficiently, um, helping them find mates, or just helping them to generally navigate their environment, these open environments where there's more light available. Now don't get me wrong, mimicry pattern alone is certainly not the only factor which is likely to predict the visual ecology of a tropical butterfly. In fact, one of the other main findings from our study is that there seems to be a pretty strong relationship between the amount a butterfly invests in its optic lobe and the height at which it flies in the forest canopy. The higher you fly, the bigger your optic lobe is relatively at least. Think about it, down here in the forest understory, and some ethomium butterflies do fly really close to the ground. Well, in these environments, there just isn't as much light compared to up there in the forest canopy, and brain tissue is really expensive to maintain, so the brains of these butterflies need to be fully optimised to the most reliable cues in their respective microhabitats, particularly in the tropical rainforest where life is pretty competitive. So overall, our work shows that the way animals perceive their environment is tightly linked to the way complex communities like those found in tropical rainforests are adaptively assembled. If you're interested in hearing more, then I've put the link to the full paper in the description of this video. In the meantime, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and follow me on social media to stay updated with all my wildlife and science adventures. In the meantime, I'll see you next time. Let's get scratching.